One of the things that was holding them back from accommodating greater deal flow was the amount of diligence they're doing in the pre-LOI and pre-LOI phase, right? When the team that's engaged in the transaction is actually quite small. Um, so his team uh, was doing a lot of the integration planning phase. They wanted a really good blueprint on exactly what would happen before um, uh, the transaction would, uh, would, before they would even proceed with a letter of intent. Um, one of the changes I made pretty quickly was, no, 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 let's make some assumptions based upon your historical experience. Get the LOI in place, because I think we all know that, right, that exclusivity period is really, really valuable, turning this into a bilateral as opposed to allowing them to continue to shop. And then once you've got them locked down, you engage the greater organization to start to diligence and plan the integration thereafter, right? So long as you've got enough of a hypothesis on exactly what, on, on what the integration is likely to look like, you can build and you can you feel comfortable that the financial model you're building is probably right or at least more likely than not to be correct and that the variance around what it's going to end up isn't too large that's good enough Welcome to M&A Science Live, where leading M&A practitioners share lessons learned from their experience. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, visit mascience.com and subscribe to our free newsletter. Every Monday, we share highlights from our interviews and publications so you can continuously improve your M&A skills. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science. Joining me today is Ken Bond, head of corporate development at Cetera Financial Group. I should also mention you're at Aon, head of corporate development for about 20 years. <laughs> not, not that long. 12 years. And, I, 12 and years. I, ran, I ran a good portion of it, yes. <laughs> and you were doing corp dev before that? Um, I was. I've been in corp dev since, you know, 99. All right, perfect. Thanks for filling that in on my introduction. And you're all, also, Ken, is a transaction advisor, board member, m and Leadership Council, Today, we're going to talk about structuring teams who are approaching diligence and how to find an outstanding project manager. How's it going, Ken? I'm well, thanks. It's good to see you, Kisa. Great, great. Glad to have you here. Can we kick things off with a little bit about your background? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been in corp dev forever. Um, uh, I certainly came at this profession probably a little differently than others. Um, so I did not come through the front door uh, as an ex-investment banker. Um, I came through the consulting side, right? And for a lot of people, I guess, you know, that's pretty pretty typical. Um, I drove submarines around with the Navy for a little bit. And after I got out of that, I ended up getting an MBA and went through, um, went to McKinsey. And out of McKinsey, I joined a corporate development team, um, Level 3 Communications. And that was, um, that was a lot of fun, right? Um, really enjoyed working for them. And I stayed in the tech space and bounced around with a few other big names. Um, but about 13 years ago, I joined Aon um, as uh, on their corporate development team, and that was uh, a big shift for me. It was out of tech, and it was into uh, risk management insurance. Um, ran on a global basis their corporate development team for the PNC um, re, uh, reinsurance and uh, global affinity teams. So did a lot of did a lot of deals, about 250 deals over 12 years half acquisitions, half divestitures in, outside the U.S., 40% in, and uh, set up some joint ventures, tore a couple down, um, sold off, you know, big chunks of uh, our African network, um, and set up uh, uh, set up some interesting uh, JVs along the way. So, excited. Joined Cetera in January, so that's a new uh, new adventure for me. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, they're private equity owned, so it's, uh, it's good to be out of the public markets, and uh, uh, enjoyable to be part of a private equity uh, sponsored um, uh, firm for the first time. You're our first interview. You've done it all. I can ask you so many different things here. Uh, well, I'm going to get to the, the the nuclear sub things later. But level three, how is that? Did you work with Dan Crusoe over there by chance? Yes, I did. In fact, yeah, of course. What was it like working with before him? he left level three? Uh, yeah, you should work with him before he left. Breaker, yeah, 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 yeah. And even looked at, uh, you know, when I was looking for opportunities, I talked to Dan at one of his port codes after he had left. Um, this was even after he, uh, he did the SELEC thing and he had founded um, uh, his uh, private equity fund in uh, in Boulder. 
Um, and uh, a lot of the X level three alum are hanging around the, the hoop um, with uh, various uh, um, companies that are still sponsored by him. So are still engaged with him. So yeah, yeah he's, uh, he's done really well. know what it's like to work with him. But yeah, I met him when he was at Zayo. I think he ran into him in Chicago when he was at a, presenting at an event and just introduced myself and kept harassing him over email like I do every other executive at big conference events. So I ran into a, I ran into him recently because I was in London um, and I was doing a guest lecture um, at LSE and um, his it was actually the University of Chicago um, uh, facility there um, their adjunct campus and it was. Um, uh, a friend of mine was doing the guest lecturing, and he brought me in as a as a speaker to his to his MBA class. And as I'm walking through the halls, there's this giant picture of Dan Caruso on the wall <laughs> in the middle of London. <laughs> I sent him a note afterwards saying, "Hey, there is a really large photograph of you in this hallway <laughs> in London. Are you, were you aware?" <laughs> that is awesome. I've been tr- I've been trying to get him on the podcast. We got to get on that. I, uh, I'm going to get your help on you that. Would be- so okay, I, okay, so we went from level three after that, we went to Aeon, which is a whole world of its own. No, no, no. Huh? Sorry, I, I didn't. I went to, after level three, I went to Motorola, then to Dell, and then to Aeon. All right, that shows you how well I pay attention. So <laughs> That's okay. We're, for the sake of time, we're going to go through those and go for the most recent one from Aeon, yeah. the Satira, because you went from a large public corp dev team, um, pretty significant scale, and then yeah. going to the current role where you're basically standing up the function, if I remember right? There, There is an existing team, and I came in to help manage the team, small but mighty, um, and they're, um, they need to become a high volume shop and they're not a high volume shop today. So it's just more interested, uh, they were very interested in the, the practices and your approach towards managing the team and how how I might um, scale it um, to accommodate greater volume flow with effectively the same resources. You still have a lot of building to do. I do. Yeah. What's the What's the difference? Like, I, I want to. I love to get this big contrast because it is one extreme to the other. It is. It is. It is. So we were, we were. Um, I was effectively running two shops out of uh, out of Aon. Right. There was a team in Chicago and there was a team in London. Um, Thirteen resources in total. But about three deal leads, a couple analysts, and some um, a lot of project managers, and we we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but at Cetera, um, there's about four people, right? Four, five, depending on how you count it. Um, and I have one project lead and one deal, uh, one project leader, one deal lead, and two fairly senior managers and analysts. Um, so you might even call them a senior analyst, right? Um, they're beginning to take over uh, responsibility for running their own deals crazy, crazy competent. And my deal lead there um, is extremely capable. Um, in fact, he's um, quite quite qualified to run the team by himself. Um, I think the the issue was simply scaling uh, the team so that it could accommodate more volume. And a lot of that I'm doing through process change, right? Uh, as opposed to adding resources at the moment. Um, so for example, one of the things that was holding them back from accommodating greater deal flow was the amount of diligence they're doing in the pre-LOI and the pre-LOIs phase, right? When the team that's engaged in the transaction is actually quite small. Um, so his team uh, was doing a lot of the integration planning phase. They wanted a really good blueprint on exactly what would happen before um, uh, the transaction would, uh, would, before they would even proceed with a letter of intent. Um, one of the changes I made pretty quickly was, no, 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 let's make some assumptions based upon your historical experience, get the LOI in place, because I think we all know that, right, that exclusivity period is really, really valuable, turning this into a bilateral as opposed to allowing them to continue to shop. And then once you've got them locked down, you engage the greater organization to start to diligence and plan the integration thereafter, right? So long as you've got enough of a hypothesis on exactly what, on on what the integration is likely to look like, you can build and you can you feel comfortable that the financial model you're building is probably right or at least more likely than not to be correct and that the variance around what it's going to end up isn't too large that's good enough right um they were just afraid of of engaging or signing an loi without a, a very high level of certainty and that that's really not 
at least I did. I, I didn't feel that was how you ought to do. Uh, how you ought to go about doing that. So once we shifted that diligence, once I got more comfortable with risk, sign the LOIs, figure it out in diligence. When you're engaging more functional experts, um, then you know we're getting good outcomes, right? So we got three deals done already this year. Got a deal already signed. Um, we're in the pre-close period. That'll close, you know, next year. Two more deals in diligence now, and two more LOIs that are currently outstanding. So, you know, the deal volume has definitely picked up, and I haven't added anybody to the team yet. You mentioned you have. We said you had a deal lead and a couple of analysts. Yeah, so a senior vice president. Um, so he's very capable. Um, he is the primary deal lead, and then I've got a director who is just now beginning to run transactions on his own, and a, and actually was an analyst who is such a rock star that I've we've, we've actually started to hand him even the um, some of the smaller deals to manage on his own, and he's doing just a fantastic job with them. So I, I am planning on asking for more budget <laughs> next year. So I'd like to add a couple more bodies to the team. But I'm going to add them at the bottom, right? Um, um, junior folks um, cool. to help and com come in and support the team that is stepping up and starting to run their own transactions. So, um, adding at the bottom, pushing the the existing folks up and asking them to do more. Where's the pipeline come from? Uh, it's all over the place right now. Um, in the independent broker dealer space, if you're running a BD that's got you know anywhere from five to ten billion of AUA. Um, assets under administration, um, your life is miserable, right? You don't, you, you really don't want to be in that space anymore. So um, we're getting a lot of flow from those folks, um, more than we can probably even uh, uh, rubbing up against organizational constraints. So uh, just that tail part, but you know, it'd be, it would be interesting to talk about just contrasting the more of the aesthetics between a public and private company function, uh, you know, in terms of, hey, you're, you're, mm -hmm. You mentioned a shift already in your ability to execute with uh, getting comfortable taking more risks. Um, but what about some mm -hmm. of the other components? You know, obviously public, you got a lot more reporting. Uh, I'm assuming responsibilities and so forth. Or oh yeah, what are the that's, difference? That's a great. That's a great question. I get that a lot. Um, uh, the, you're optimizing for the long term um, generally. Uh, I think there's a lot of pressures in public companies um, to that cause you to optimize in some instances for short-term outcomes, quarterly outcomes that um, may not be in the best long-term interest uh, of the business. When you don't have those quarterly obligations anymore, it's a, it's a lot easier to make longer-term investments, which is super helpful. Um, and not having uh, uh, that pressure uh, frees you up to do more value-added things as well. There are a lot less reporting requirements. Um, there's just less people that that um, are engaged in the decision-making process. So, you know, I can count on two, two hands the number of people who run the company, um, including the board members. So, you know, you get, to, you get to know those people, you get to understand what their risk appetite is and what type of transactions they'll support. And life becomes a lot easier, right? Um, in terms of just engaging and um, getting, um, uh, you know, moving, moving transactions quickly. The other thing that, that can't be underestimated is the just the ability to take risk and price risk more appropriately. Um, in a large public company, right, you're, you, you get certain functional stakeholders who are maybe more risk adverse than others. And I think we just fail safe more often than not um, and don't want to take on or wear a risk that could potentially blow up um, in, in with a sponsor back company, you can, I think, more appropriately or properly evaluate that risk and um, wear it if needed or transfer it to a third party more effectively. So you're, you're willing to take on that tail liability uh, that may be attached to it. It sounds like there's a, a lot more efficiency, a greater view on um, sort of balancing the long view around this um, mm -hmm. without that pressure and then faster decision making. If you got less yeah. heads on this stuff, you can actually get to make decisions a lot quicker. Well, and, and, and higher expectations, I would say, of uh, deal volume as well, right? So the whole playbook for sponsors is is M and A. So you know that's that's probably the last piece that I'll uh, I'll say in terms of what's really exciting is, man, you are impactful. 
Um, the, it, it, m and is critical to a sponsor's um, growth plans. Right? They need to grow, they need to grow a lot. Um, it's part of how uh, they get the returns that they need to justify the initial investment. And when you run corporate development, right, you're, you're a key player now. Um, you are core to their value proposition and then getting a good, uh, a good return. So they care a lot about you um, and uh, the volume that you're bringing and uh, um, you're having impact. Which is um, which is nice. When they say they'll have your head, it kind of means a lot more too. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the sword, die by the sword, my friend. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about nuclear submarines. Ah. <laughs> I, I I just I want to I want to jump into it, and then we'll get back onto the M and A stuff. But how has your background coming from the Navy helped you as a corporate development practitioner today? Oh, man, you wouldn't think it would be applicable, would you? But um, listen, there is uh, one of the things that uh, very quickly you learn in the nuclear Navy is uh, is winging it doesn't cut it. Right? <laughs> they like process. <laughs> they like you to start up the reactor according to the manual. Um, and when things go wrong, they want you to execute the procedure that they've outlined um, point by point. Um, you don't get to ad lib it. Um, so I developed, a, you, you develop a pretty good appreciation and um, respect for the power of process. Um, uh, at the same time, right, um, it's the Navy is a little bit different than some of the other armed services. It's a community that's been built up over many years, understanding the isolation of being at sea. So there's also an accommodation for the fact that you can't write a procedure for every potential um, scenario that you face. So while um, they uh, they do outline a lot of process, they they also give you some freedom um, to uh, adapt that process to unforeseen circumstances. So, from a deal context, right, you understand. Uh, from my perspective, in terms of how I apply that to a corporate development world, is um, process um, having a good process for execution of diligence and contracting, integration planning, integration execution right, is critical um, to uh, to a good outcome, right? It also becomes the mechanism by which your organization learns, uh, learns from failure. Um, it's the way you incorporate um, uh, lessons learned. Um, and you also understand that, you know, a rigid process um, can serve you well, but also you need to be flexible enough to adapt that process to every deal because every deal is a bit unique. Every integration is a little unique. Um, so you need to be flexible enough um, but but definitely need to understand that that process is your friend, um, and you need to embrace that. Awesome, um, that's a key one. That's a lot to unpack uh, our, our theme around project yeah. management today. Yeah. Was there any other key lessons from that experience that ported over? Uh, no, there's there there are so many, my friend. Um, Still like waking up at stark four a.m. and getting your day kicked <laughs> off. Or, well, yeah, but you know, I, I think uh, the organizational learning um, and process are probably kind of the bigger pieces, right? Um, uh, we we ran, you know, learning how to sleep on or be functional on three to four hours of sleep, um, you know, after you know three or four months at sea is, is also a good lesson learned. So <laughs> you came out of that with uh, with a healthy appreciation that. Uh, any other career you go into, you're going to get more sleep at night. And that's kind of helpful. Right? <laughs> when we work deal hours, you know, it's not, you know, you, you've been there, you kind of get an, you, you get an understanding. That you, for it. Yeah. You get training for it. <laughs> um, when you say organizational learning, yeah. uh, can you walk me through what does that mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. It, it actually comes up. There's lots of different aspects to this, right? Um, one is we make mistakes. I mean, we all make mistakes. We're never going to be perfect in what we do. Uh, understand that every transaction, though, has more downside risk than upside potential. So you you need to you need to be thoughtful about how you go about diligencing all the different phases of of a transaction. The process. Um, that you put in place that you're that you're executing should have fairly defined kind of um, uh, elements to it, from artifacts to um, aids to um, people that have uh, through the steps of the process. Let's put it, let's put it that way. 
And, I, and the other key aspect is not only do you have process, but you've got professionals that help you execute that process. And those are the project, project managers that, we, that I talk about. Um, even if you've got a strong process, if you're executing it kind of differently uh, per the whims of the um, deal leads that you've got, um, you're, you're opening yourself up to making the same mistakes you've made in the past, right? The process is there. It's, it's been based upon and built upon kind of the mistakes you've made, right? And you tweak it each time. You're like, oh, yeah, let's not do that again. Oh, we structured this earn out wrong. Let's not do that again. Oh, we, we didn't check. You know, TCPA liability last time we looked at a call center, you know, add in that, make sure that we understand kind of where we need to look for these types of exposures when we're looking at a firm that's got these characteristics or make sure that the due diligence checklist contains these items. Um, so next time we're, we're a little smarter um, or we've got a red, uh, we get a, we get a warning um, light before we, you know, we step into uh, the shoes and start wearing that risk. Um, I, I, I like the process is is super important in making sure that we, as an organization, right, don't make the same mistakes again. The, the next question then is, um, well, then how do you make sure you uh, you have, you make sure that you learn from that and you uh, make the most of that uh, process uh, when you're executing? And that's through the project managers. The project managers uh, make sure that the deal leads execute the process according to how it's designed. And when we deviate from that process. It's with good intention and and an overt decision as opposed to just um, a whimsical one, right? That the circumstances of the, the the transaction that you're in, maybe it's because you're in a, a, a compressed process, um, an auction process. Maybe it's because you know the uh, the environment or the culture of the country in which you're doing the diligence um, isn't as open, and they don't have a, as a historical, um, um, the disclosure process, for example, is not historically run the same way as you would in a Western, uh, as in the US, right? Those, those deviations um, need, to be, um, need to be done, but you need to be thoughtful about them and just understand the exposure you're taking on when you make those, uh, uh, when, you, when you deviate the process. Um, your view on organizational learning it's based, it's essentially parallel to having a culture of continuous improvement. And then you mentioned the project management role as almost being a pivot point around yeah. this, but also to owning this process. Um, talk to me more about that person. Like where, who is that person? Where do you find them from? The characteristics about it? I think there's misconceptions on this because then there's people like, m a needs more than the project manager and there are certain other attributes that get added on so what exactly is that it's a great point and one last one last item let's go back just a second on the on the process improvements because there is another way that you improve the process as well it's through the feedback um, after you do the, when you do the post close reviews um, there's an element of the post close review which is also um, helpful which is just open polling of the participants in the in the due diligence and integration process on what went right, what went wrong, capturing those learnings, and then making sure that the process adapts uh, to accommodate those uh, those learnings. So that's probably the one other area. Uh, and it and you hit it right on the head. This is a continuous pro continuous improvement process, right? We're always looking for feedback and trying to get better, and understanding that it's a continuous process. There's no end game, right? You just uh, you the, the, try to keep getting right. better, better and better, right? The other area which is probably relevant, especially given in light of some of the panel discussions you've you've uh, you've had me on, and thank you very much for for including me in them, is my comments come from somebody who's who's looking to optimize around volume, right? Um, if you are a low volume shop where you're doing only one or two or maybe three deals a year, then then these this process might not apply to you. Um, and maybe um, the deal lead can also wear the role of PM as well, right? So uh, my perspective is, listen, if you're if you're trying to do you know five six deals a year, meaning you're also you're probably looking at ten to ten to fifteen deals in a diligence process, assuming you know a couple of them are, um, fall out um, either due to findings or you just don't win through the auction process, then um, uh, you know this is this is probably a this is the process I'm talking about probably is probably more applicable for you, right? Or even more, 
right? So back to the PM question. Um, where do you find these people? These are pro project management professionals, right? They're generally people who have managed integrations in the past that are steeped in the operations of your business. More often than not, they come from IT simply because the if your organization has a PMO, um, a project management organization or a central group where PMs kind of hang out and get tasked uh, to do stuff, uh, whether they're strategic process, uh, strategic projects or more often than not kind of IT um, projects, um, that is a potential source. Um, I, I find generally the IT PMs don't do well in the role. Um, and that they need to be more broadly based. Um, but they need to have broader exposure to the other functional areas of the organization. And if you if you are fortunate enough to find people who have managed integration work in the past, they're best suited for these types of roles, heavy operations experience. These are people who get stuff done. Um, and then what you do is you bring them into the diligence piece and you teach them the diligence aspects. Um, uh, and how a diligence process is run. And they, they actually run that piece as well. And then they, as you shift ideally out of diligence into contracting, the diligence team then shifts into pre-integration planning uh, phase and they continue to manage that aspect while the, um, the corp dev and legal teams uh, get to work on the contracting piece. So the key thing is get somebody that really knows the business yes. and to get the cream of the crop is somebody that's got experience integrating into the business. Yes, that's right. And you can find them. A lot of the, the, those, those people are outsourced already. So if you've, if you've managed large scale integrations before you'll hire externally for kind of a flex capacity, um, whether it's one of the big four or some of the other consulting shops that provide um, project management resources or, uh, or post-merger integration support, PMI support. Um, those people that have have some tenure in those organizations would would fill that role really, really well. So even if it's not within your organization, it may be there may be an ability to find folks who have played in your sector or your um, your industry um, from uh, the teams or consulting shops that provide PMI support for that uh, for your industry. Awesome. So just poach one from local. Consulting. Poach from the PMIs. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, very, uh, very e easy to execute on LinkedIn these days. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Uh, it also so, gives you the opportunity to rent before you buy too, right? So you, you, you get some experience with these folks before you bring them on board. Listen, I think that's the biggest thing this industry is missing, Ken. You know, I, I work in tech and we use Upwork all the time. We hire contractors. We try it. It doesn't work. Not a big deal. N nothing. Yeah. Then, and I've had two of my key <laughs> management team that were hired that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, you jump into full-time hires. It doesn't work out. It's expensive and it sucks for yeah. the other person to make that transition. I think m, &M needs it because we just got this like flux capacity that happens that almost majority of the organizations deal with, unless you're on a steady roll-up um, consolidation, or like you're at a huge market that's just gonna keep growing yeah. uh, in terms of your function. But, so they, it should be there. I don't know, I'm interested in that space. If you ever wanna do something, let me know. We can- uh, uh, Happy yeah. to, happy to, always. I think, yeah, listen, you, you, you come in one of two flavors if you're a corp dev person, right? Um, there's vast majority of corp dev shops out there, you know, they spend 80 to 90% of their time doing PowerPoint decks on strategic projects and about 10 to 20% of their time actually doing something. Um, and then there's a there, there's another group that spend all their time like just executing, uh, they're, they're just deal execution machines, right? And that's what you just do deal after deal after deal and you try to get as many done as you possibly can. And that's the latter is, is where I, where I come from. Um, uh, and I find it more fulfilling as well. Right? Awesome. That's uh, the right profile to look for. Yeah. When we think about the deal, just to identify other players, mm -hmm. are there any, you got your key project management person that could potentially deal lead depending on your volume. Yeah. Um, any other key folks involved as you go approach diligence? Uh, so as you get, uh, yes. So, so as you, depending on the volume and depending on your organization's ability to staff or invest in the function. And, and when I say invest in the function, um, 
I mean, on a run rate basis, it really does pale. And I know everybody gets all excited about, hey, listen, you're asking for headcount in a very tight, everybody's got tight budgets, but truly the investment on a run rate basis, especially given the potential impact of M&A, is just not that great. So, you know, I, I think generally the the corporate dev teams are understaffed um, and not, uh, the investment is just insufficient for the impact that they're looking to achieve. Um, the, the areas where you see the greatest complexity, um, if you're doing professional services, that's generally going to be around IT and HR, right? Adding resources that are specific to those functional areas that speak M&A um, or speak corporate development um, are, can be very, very helpful. Whether they're hardlined into the corp dev team or dotted line doesn't really matter so much as they are dedicated to M&A. Um, there, and, and this actually uh, is probably the other key element for capturing kind of corporate lessons learned and, you know, keeping that uh, that 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 knowledge um, that's gained from a transaction and being able to leverage it for the next deal and the next deal and the next deal. Um, so HR professionals, it is. Um, HR ops, um, there are so many aspects of HR that are really, really complex um, that you're asking almost always to break systems because onboarding, bulk onboarding of a bunch of people that are coming over from another uh, another company is just not how HR systems are built generally. So transactions almost always cause you to kind of break the system in order to jam people in. Um, or Say you've got a long gate of pre-closed period. Say you've got you're you're buying a firm and you don't have a legal entity in the area where you know you're acquiring people and it's an asset deal and not an equity deal. Um, how are you going to hire those people? Who are you going to who's going to employ them? How are you going to keep paying them? I mean, there's just there there can be a ton of complexity and these are these are solutions. You need solutions that um, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel each and every time with the, with the transaction. So having a professional on the HR side, who um, has seen a lot of deal volume is super valuable. Um, you, you really don't wanna lose them um, uh, after each transaction and bring up somebody new. If you're at a multinational, uh, multinational corporation, um, then it's even more valuable because you're likely dealing, depending on where you're doing the deal, this could be your first deal in Colombia or Latin America or you know in Asia. And that, that person hasn't done a transaction before. If you can parachute in an HR professional that can that can uh, relate to uh, their counterpart in country or in a business unit that has never done a deal, they can guide them through the process. And th that's super valuable for and impactful uh, for that individual. So the other area, though, is also IT. Exact same issues, right? T ton of complexity. Um, navigating the organization can be very difficult. Ensuring you have the right functional experts, sub-functional experts, do I need an infrastructure person? Is this a business application system? Is this a cybersecurity um, issue? Making sure you've got the right functional experts deployed in the beat in the uh, the diligence process on the team um, and uh, in the integration planning phase uh, that needs to be coordinated. Um, and having one person who works in deal time um, that is seeing a bunch of transactions that understands again how we break. Um, systems that understands, listen, uh, the assumption here that we're going to re-image their machines um, is not a good assumption. Don't ever think of that. <laughs> and here are the three different things that are probably going to go wrong if you do that. Just order the equipment now and get the equipment, you know, ready to go. Um, things like that. So you're not you're not relearning them. Those are pretty much, I, I would almost guarantee that those are common and I hear them across um, panels when I when I sit on panels and talk to people who work in other industries everybody agrees right Listen, those are the things that matter um, uh, to all of us and then there's other areas um, that also matter depending on your industry right in in my world uh, my new world right conversions you know getting assets converted off of one platform to another is a big area of, of complexity. So making sure that you've got resources that have seen transactions that can speak to that expertise is important. If you're in tech, um, you know, uh, there's there's other areas that, you, uh, that are equally painful that you need to have specialized resources for. The way you, uh, across all of that, how you organize yourself um, is, Honestly, I think a little less important. Uh, I think I felt differently about that before, 
But I think if you're if you're a, a functional team, a healthy team, and you've got good strong leadership, whether those people dotted or solid line into you, don't really care, right? They're they're there to help you solve problems, and if you lead them properly, um, the team will be healthy and functional. I totally agree. What about the lawyers? Where you know, would you look at building that as a full time capability or? Listen, um, I, uh, there is almost always somebody um, who's, who's got transaction experience on staff in house counsel, right? Uh, there has to be, right? And they're your partner. They're, they're your closest functional um, um, person. Uh, they're your closest function within the organization, right? The attorneys that uh, I've worked with side by side at Aon have been some of my closest friends. Um, I've learned so much from them. Um, they are, we are joined at the hip and um, is so long as you treat, uh, you're a team and you work collaboratively together, you test each other, you push each other, and um, you are humble enough to understand that you, you need them as much as you need, uh, they need you, then you're going to work really, really well together and you're, you're going to have, um, you're going to be very successful. So I would argue there they're your closest um, teammates uh, when it comes to getting getting transactions done. You always need ex- external counsel just for the arms and legs piece of it. And um, somebody who's very, very current on current state of the art, um, understands what market is and um, is you know, licensed to perform law in that jurisdiction, right? You kind of need those folks. Um, but having in-house counsel that understands your risk framework, um, risk sharing framework, and and how your organization wears risk and what is comfortable accepting and can think collaboratively with you on uh, solutions for passing risk off or mitigating risk that's uncovered in the diligence process is really, really helpful, right? Um, and that's, uh, that, that, is, that is critical. And you don't need a high volume shop to justify that. These are people who probably in low volume, t- uh, low volume companies are wearing other hats whether they're the corporate secretary or they're um uh, the corporate just the corporate at, uh, attorney in general um they probably have you, you've got somebody in there who has deal um deal experience a transactional attorney in addition to general counsel who in our world almost always is uh, an ex litigator so cool um let's talk to you about how you run your team uh, it's so, like the practical uh, my, how-tos. That's what I was thinking was do a little practical, give me the how-tos, how you do it. And then we can just like walk through made up example, you know, the timeline wise, how it would go down. Sure. Um, listen, from a structure perspective, um, my team is divided up into three components, right? I've got a, uh, some resources deployed on sourcing. Um, got a, resources that are deployed on transaction execution and then resources deployed on integration. So those are kind of the three critical areas. You could say sourcing strategy for some in, uh, for some teams. You also see that function kind of rolled in. And some corp dev teams are organized as kind of strategy and then transaction execution. So um, I, I like um, the if you're if you're going to be doing a lot of deals, then I think having source dedicated sourcing resources is critical. And um, uh, we can go into how you structure all of that a little bit later. But obviously those. Those folks are looking a lot more like sales teams, and they have they have comp plans that look a lot more like a sales comp plan, where they're rewarded from getting transactions um, um, closed or um, introducing and then paid on transactions that actually close. Uh, the deal team it looks uh, are a bunch of investment bankers, right? Um, Ex investment bankers and analysts um, who are very experienced in getting transactions uh, over the line. And then my integration leads we've already talked about. For a deal, uh, a, a typical deal, um, will get engaged uh, in the sourcing um, uh, timeline. Well, somebody's reached out, um, uh, my team has either reached out or somebody's reached out to my sourcing lead and wants to have a conversation. So we get engaged, talk to them about what their objectives are, um, start batting around uh, potential solutions to um, to their either succession issues or if they're just looking to get uh, a transaction done, how we might find middle ground. That's uh, that's good. That's a good outcome for both of us. If we can get that, uh, if we get to the uh, the point where it's worthy exploring, get the NDA in place, exchange a preliminary set of data. My deal leads will then 
um, uh, get engaged. Uh, we'll collect the data uh, from the other side, and then we'll build an evaluation model based upon some assumptions around how we think this thing would ultimately fold in. But then you notice, right, I'm trying to rely on the expertise of the team. I am not engaging the organization broadly with um, yet um, because they're engaged, they got a day job and they're working on some pretty critical things that I don't want to disrupt at the moment. So I'd like to leverage um, the expertise of, of my own team, both the integration team and uh, the deal execution team to build an initial hypothesis around how the, how the business would fold in. We socialize that uh, with my boss um, inside the finance team, make sure that everybody signed off on it, and then we present pricing. If the pricing is acceptable, we'll ink it in a letter of intent, um, non-binding, of course, um, because there is no thing, nothing other than a non-binding LOI. They may be marketed as binding, but in reality, they're always subject to confirmatory diligence. So um, we're going to get uh, uh, we're going to get a letter of intent done just so everybody understands kind of what was agreed at the time because memories kind of fade and what was agreed sometimes get, gets retraded. So letters letters of intent are always, always helpful. What isn't helpful is negotiating an SPA and a letter of intent. So I'm not going to talk about indemnities. We're not going to talk about limits of liability. We're not going to talk about a bunch of other items that would be that, that are going to be predicated based on, basically on what you find during the diligence process. So uh, of course, what I'm talking about right now is a bilateral process. If we're in an auction, I think kind of everybody understands how an auction auctions work. But if this, assuming we're in a bilateral, the letter of intent is mainly going to cover kind of basic transaction structure, strategic rationale for the transaction, and then kind of cost or value the or value the organization. And in the wealth management space, which is a little little unique, right? We need to talk about um, transition assistance for the advisors that are associated with the other broker dealer and how we're going to, uh, what value will those provide and what type of assistance we'll be willing to provide to them uh, for the uh, for the conversion process. Um, after that's done, listen, it's a standard process, right? Open up a data room, um, assuming that everything's inked and we'll go through a diligence process. Diligence generally takes Kind of four to six weeks, assuming we've got a cooperative seller that's fully advised and has a knows how to manage a data room. If they're really nervous about the transaction leaking, uh, in professional services worlds, of course, right? Transaction um, diligence process, you know, is really risky to sellers, right? If the transaction leaks prematurely, their clients or their um, uh, their personnel may get a little wobbly and could walk. Um, and that could cause economic harm to the sellers and impact the value of their business. So they're going to, they're generally going to be pretty tight with who's going to be in the tent. And that could generally impact you. That can sometimes impact your, your, your timeline. Um, if they don't have enough people in the tent to, uh, respond to your data requests. So I say four to six weeks, assuming, you know, they got a good number of people in the tent and they're responsive to, uh, your data requests. Have you tried using deal? I'm sorry. If you tried using deal room, you could probably compress that timeline with a, you know, a nice <laughs> product design for diligence management. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Great product. Great, great, great product. Um, no, I, I we, don't know uh, you, we, so, <laughs> but, um, I, so I, I get that part. What, what's after that diligence? Time frame? <laughs> yeah. Just contracting. So after, after the diligence phase, right, we're, we're going to shift into contracting and integration planning. So that's when the corp dev team gets even more engaged and working hand in hand with the legal team to get the contracting piece done. Generally, that takes about four to six weeks. Um, it can go faster. It can go slower. Um, people keep saying, oh, my gosh, why, why in the world does it take that long? Um, schedules. <laughs> that's why takes that long. Um, almost always, there's a pretty significant scheduling burden attached to all of these deals. And, you know, it just takes a while to get through all that. Um, so while the, the body of the agreement... Schedules. Um, well, you're going to make a bunch of reps and warranties around how the, uh, the business is operated, but um, there will be exceptions to that. And when you have exceptions, you're going to detail them out. Um, you're going to schedule them. Um, and those schedules, once they get produced, which is a burden, need to be reviewed. And that will then it's actually a bit of a diligence problem. If you promise that the business is operated X and it turns out it's actually X with the exception of the following items and you find that those items that they're taking exception to are material, 
Maybe that poses additional risk that you need to wear. Maybe you need to mitigate that. Maybe it's a price chip. Maybe it's, you know, other, it might open up the negotiations and you might have to, um, to, um, to adjust the terms that have been agreed. Now, unfortunately, right, the schedules always come out after uh, the contract has pretty much been, is close to final form. Um, so it's kind of, and people are tense. This is, people are exhausted, um, been working pretty hard. Sellers are, are not of a mindset to, they're kind of done and dusted. They don't really want to um, uh, negotiate anymore. And, you know, it's, that's one of the, one of the areas where I think a lot of mistakes are made is in that nth hour when you're doing the schedule reviews and the final, final turns of the document. Um, there have been some material changes. I'm sorry about that. There have been some material changes that happen um, uh, at the nth hour, and you just need to be really vigilant. So uh, I guess that is where the Navy training pays off, right? Being comfortable on fairly short hours, short hours of sleep, and making sure that you're uh, frosty at the at the uh, as you get closer to the signing, and you're really paying attention to those final edits that are coming back and forth, and the schedules that are getting sent across is absolutely critical. Too many mistakes are made then. Wow. I'm glad you expanded on that. Otherwise, somebody would email me and ask me, and I won't be able to answer it as well as you did. Um, so well, the attorneys we, actually will answer it even better, right? So uh, I just be, play an attorney on television. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that's where I'm, I'm thinking about creating a series where we do back to back. We have like the deal, the, the deal practical experience yeah. and the lawyer, because then you get like a layman explanation you understand, and then the real like <laughs> technical. No, no. You can't do it back to back. You got to put us uh, side by side. Side, I've by got, side. I got two guys that would love to come on and they would have no problem throwing me under the bus. Like that is the worst idea I've ever heard of. Ken, here's okay. the real do that. I'm going to have you help me set that up because yeah, 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 I have yeah, not yeah, covered yeah, enough layers. So we definitely have room to cover more topics. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. I, uh, so we, we got this part. Are we done with the deal? Are we closed? No, we're signed. Um, and now becomes the hard part of, of kind of making sure that you get, uh, depending on what you're doing, right. There's a, there's a lot of different permutations of what could fall out that, right. Either you are, um, if it's a sign and close, you could be closed. Um, uh, sign and closes don't happen that often. Almost always there, there are some pre-closing conditions, some conditions that need to be satisfied. Um, CPs conditions pres precedent to closing um, is the is the shorthand that people just say CPs to close that need to be satisfied um, before you can get there. Sometimes it's regulatory approval. Sometimes it's consents. Um, if you've got a highly regulated industry like like the wealth management industry, your entire integration takes place during the pre-close period because the whole process of closing is the conversion process of moving assets from one platform to another. So there's a great deal of planning and coordination that have to go into um, the, with, the with the custodians of the assets and making sure that you convert those assets in a very um, uh, methodical manner and a controlled manner so that there's little to no impact to the actual investors that own those assets. Um, so you're, it's, a, it's a highly regulated process and that can take up to you know four, five, six, months to get done. So you can have a very long pre-close period. You can have a very short or no pre-close period. Depends on the circumstances of the deal. I think what, what people fail sometimes to appreciate is that the longer the pre-close period, the more risk you're wearing, right? There can there will be impact onto the business. Um, and you have very little recourse, even though you try to contract it, um, operating pre-closing, operating covenants on how they're going to operate the business. But the reality is if there's a material degradation in the business, right? MAE clauses in Delaware, what, been executed once? And while, you know, people say, well, really, there's only been one, but the reality is there's been a lot more renegotiations of contracts um, that could claim um, an MAE event and that ultimately the terms of the deal were changed to accommodate the change in the business, right? So what is um, it called? Is it MAE? you don't want to get into that. Yeah, this? material adverse event. Okay, okay. Comet, comet strike. Comet comes down to hit the building that you're about to buy, right? Um, these are these are really big events, right? That have a, a material change in the business um, that occurred during pre-close period. Um, that is, uh, it, these are these are really really big events, right? So it's not 
um, they they had uh, a claim um, that there's they've been sued or um, there was a sexual harassment lawsuit that was filed or um, one of their products was was not approved by a regulator. This is something um, even larger than that. So we call them comet strike like events. Um, it's it's that level of impact, and it's so high that in the state of Delaware, one. Uh, one MAE event has been certified <laughs> or been been uh, worked its has worked its way through the court system as a, a true MAE. Um, uh, but uh, many events, many contracts have been renegotiated as a result of events that could be construed as an MAE. So purchase agreements have been modified more than once uh, to accommodate significant events that have occurred that could have potentially been MAEs. Nevertheless. Um, the more risk you have, the longer the pre-close period, the greater the risk to the buyer. You're obligated and you are incentivized to try to minimize that period. And the shorter you can make that period, the better. So you're not always doing sign and close at the same time. You use a variety of reasons. Not at all. You would split it up and also a varying degree of that time frame. But objectively, you want to minimize it as much as possible to keep things safe and secure. Yeah, I mean the sellers, the sellers are incentivized, right? They want their money as fast as possible, so they're going to ask you to bear as much risk as possible. In a standard deal, there's only two things that would cause the, the closing to not occur at signing, right? Regulatory approval from the business until the government says or the regulated body tells you that it's okay for you to own that business, and there's no there's no amount of waiving that, right? You simply can't bear that risk. I can't say, hey, I want to close it now, and yeah, if the right, I'll bear the regulatory risk attached to that. That just, you know, that doesn't work. Um, the other though is is close is um, consents, right? If a contract um, that the entity owns has a change of control provision in it, then you're obligated to go get consent from the uh, the counterparty that it's okay for you to step into their shoes and not blow up the contract now. That is where there's a great deal of question about how much risk do you want to bear? Because um, if it's a vendor contract and you're more credit worthy than the previous buyer, they're not they're not likely to cause any uh, they're not likely to throw um, any water on the situation. So do I really need to wait until I get consents from every one of those vendors? Probably not. Landlords are a classic example. I was actually forced one time where, the seller absolutely and adamantly required us to go get consents from every single landlord that they had. And it was the worst mistake I've ever made. What a nightmare. Um, Just getting, I couldn't close until I got all of them done. And it was just, it was horrific. Um, uh, On the the flip side, right? So uh, uh, you've got, you've got some contracts that are really, really material, right? Where you need to, that you're not comfortable um, closing uh, until you get them done. And they're not necessarily vendor contracts and they're more likely uh, key partnership contracts, um, key um, uh, business uh, contracts with the largest clients uh, of the or, uh, of the company that you're acquiring. You want to make sure that they're along for the ride um, and they're comfortable that this transaction with this transaction. So you got to hopefully, hopefully you've already done um, uh, those client calls, those customer calls. And that's a that's a whole nother topic on how you kind of tee up the key customer calls prior to signing. Um, uh, you want to make sure you get those done so that you ideally understand what, what you're walking into. So that is the trade, right? Um, and if you're, if you're, if you're getting pushback on a pre-closing condition that you've, you desperately want where I want to make sure that the top five clients of the business are going to be comfortable with this deal and the sellers are saying absolutely no way in the world are they going to consent to that. Then the next the, the, the next thing you need to negotiate is, all right, well, I need to talk to them before we sign. Um, and that that becomes a fairly interesting negotiation about how you heavily script those conversations and who's on the phone, how long, you, what topics are you going to talk about, and uh, when exactly does that happen? And it's generally measured within hours uh, prior to signing. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. That's where the late nights come from. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's. I, I want to cover with our time integration. Yeah. It, now take the legal hat back off and put the project management one. Yeah. Uh, how do you approach the integration side? 
Uh, um, integration, um, listen, uh, uh, the best uh, integration, you know, capabilities um, are are the most important, right? Uh, the, all the work that goes into setting up the deal and getting the transaction closed. And when we're, you know, sitting at our desks and more often than not, you know, you're, it, it, the expression is popping the champagne cork, but more often than not, it feels like putting my head on a pillow. It's like, oh my gosh, we finally got this thing signed. Thank God. And you put your head down and you're like, I can, I can now finally take a breath. The reality is you haven't created any value yet for the shareholders. You've merely set the stage for a value creation. Uh, the value, true value creation it occurs in the integration right, when you actually execute. So you've got a plan, um, a fairly well-built plan. Um, the expression of you know, no, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy is, is equally true in an integration, right? You've got a good plan. But the reality is you don't truly understand exactly the situation and some variables will change. You'll get some curveballs thrown at you. Things will change and you will have new data that comes to light that you didn't know was material before. But as it turns out, actually is material. So you need to be able to adapt. Um, at the same time, you need good governance, um, just like you had during the diligence um, phase and the contracting phase. You need a strong governance process and process um, during the integration phase. We need good war room. You need a war room, and and ultimately the process around um, a steer co is having a steering committee is probably the most important thing. That and, and an executive sponsor. The job of the steering committee is to ensure that the integration is executed according to the business case that was originally invested in by the board, or authorized by the board, or the shareholders, or whomever. Um, um, and any deviations from that are prudent and prudently done. Um, you will need to make changes. Um, we had an integration once in Netherlands um, that we were uh, we were doing where we were going to um, uh, uh, restructure a business unit and then uh, collapse from three works councils down to one. And what we figured out um, after we started getting into the integration that it would be more better better for us to um, collapse the works councils from three to one, so that we had one team that we could work with to accommodate the uh, to accomplish the restructuring. Uh, we didn't realize that at the time, but when we were um, building the integration plan, but it became evident pretty quickly as we got into the integration that that was the best path forward. Steering committee met. We adjusted the plan, um, we pivoted and we executed the, the new plan. Still aligned with the business case, um, but um, the deviation was fully bought into by all the key stakeholders before we actually did it. The other key item um, is an executive sponsor, somebody, um, the, the, the proverbial throat to choke um, uh, on the integration. Somebody has to be passionate, own it, champion it. They, they gotta wear it. Um, more. In my previous life, right, it more often than not was the country um, manager. Um, whoever was uh, running the country was the most important person in that country and ultimately was the champion of the transaction and would ensure that all the functional resources that were deployed for the benefit of that country were aligned around um, the integration and executing appropriately. So if there were any red flags or barriers that we needed to um, pull down, that person would champion um, uh, the integration in that uh, and make sure that that would ultimately happen. Um, at, um, at, at Cetera, we still have a, uh, we still have champions that um, that are that own the integration, but the steering committee represents all the key functional areas uh, with the senior leaders present. If you've had multiple um, transactions going, um, that steer co that that basically has you know, divided its time across the transactions that are in flight. And we uh, spend um, time talking about the areas where we need to either change the plan or where we're having some challenges um, executing the plan. And then we just click through next deal, then the next deal, then the next deal. So we've got one, we've got one solid block of time for the steering committee every week that goes through all of the in-flight transactions. And it's fairly regimented so that we make the best use of the executive times that, that are participating in the, in the steer Do you also have an IMO set up like a dedicated group for main GMA? 
Yeah, we do. We've got a PM, we've got a PMO team, but they're they're primarily around the projects, strategic projects, and they're more IT focused. Um, I do have a dedicated integration resource, and she is um, uh, she knows the integration. Uh, it feels like better than anybody um, uh, uh, anybody that we know, right? She is just deeply steeped in the operations of the business, and she's a she's a certified uh, PM, right? So she's um, she knows exactly what she's doing, and uh, more importantly, right? She scales, so I can I can throw temporary resources underneath her, and she can manage them to accomplish the integrations because she knows how to structure the teams and make sure the right folks are addressing the right problems. Um, you don't have a hard stop, do you? Um, I don't. No, so I okay, keep going. Awesome. I'm gonna yeah, yeah. more content the better because we'll make a better thing <laughs> with all editing. But I, uh, I I wanted to go back to this timeline because we're mentioning integration as the most critical part how you create value, but it sounded like you have integration involved prior to LOI in some um, capacity. Not prior to LOI, right? But immediately, um, well, awareness, yes. Um, uh, engagement, no, right? So I've got a weekly staff meeting and it, during that we are covering the pipeline. And yes, the integration team is present for that. Um, uh, because just the way we walk through it, it's, you know, any high priority items that we're going through the pipeline review of kind of in-flight deals and diligence efforts. And then we're also talking about stuff um, towards the end uh, on sourcing activity and things that may be coming down the pipe more for awareness. So if we're going to be doing an equity deal and that's going to require, you know, a, a, a bigger lift on the integration side, getting uh, their input on uh, both transaction structuring and how we might think about um, pulling the, uh, that business in if we were able to come to agreement on value, how we do that in the most effective way and what flexibility we might have based upon how we perceive the seller might react to our proposal um, and negotiating room um, is important. And they're helpful in that in that regard, but they're not engaged um, at that point. Um, the finance, the, the corp dev the team, the transaction execution team is really engaged in building the model and uh, with the sellers on both data requests and then ultimately talking about structure and value and see if we can find middle ground. They're aware, they're not engaged. But as soon as the LOI is signed, um, then they are engaged, right? And then the same team um, that is ultimately going to manage the integration, right? They're they're engaged way up front when we start building the, the, the diligence plan um, and staffing the diligence teams and ultimately building that pre-integration um, uh, work, uh, pre-integration. And then pre pre LOI, it's you, legal, HR, IT? No, just us, uh, us and legal for the most part. Um, we will okay. engage. We'll engage the integration team um, to help us transaction structure. Okay, and then get LOI signed. Then game time. Then it's game time. Yeah, yeah. So um, understand, right? If you're looking at a lot of deals, right? You're trying to minimize the impact on the impact on the organization of transactions that are unlikely to close, right? And every deal pre LOI is unlikely to close. <laughs> so I really don't want to impact the organization and I want to keep them out of it until we get something that's more, that's probable. And if you can find agreement around value, then it's probable, right? You, you, you're, 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 you're a big step up in terms of likelihood of the transaction to close. So, you know, keeping the organization shielded from pre LOI activity is, is pretty imperative to making sure that you're making best use of everybody else's time. Um, just one thought I was curious about was yeah. how much of your deals are banked versus proprietary? Ah, great question. Um, uh, we're fortunate. Uh, the majority of our deals are, um, are proprietary. They're bilateral, right? Um, I liked how you called it a fortunate thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's definitely fortunate, right? I mean, think about it. The biggest risk of any transaction is culture, right? Um, Culture each strategy for breakfast, right? The most strategic <laughs> strategic deal on the planet. If you've got cultural mismatch, it's dead. It's a DOA, right? It's just not going to work. Um, but if you're in a bilateral, um, you get a lot of time with the other side, right? Maybe you've got exposure to them before. If you're if you know the people and know the organization, and you've got a 20 year working relationship with the seller founder, um, the key management team members, then that's a different story altogether. But if this is something new that's come across that's approached you with an idea and you can engage them in a bilateral and you can spend a lot of time with them it helps you assess culture if you're running a process 
and this is kind of the first time you're 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 you're, um, you're meeting them. I mean, you get what? You get a management presentation for four hours, and then maybe a couple one on ones and a few other potential discussions. I mean, come on, four hours? That's total kabuki theater, man. I can convince you I'm Scottish for four hours, right? I mean, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. I was just on uh, another podcast, and I, I kind of had to let that point out that it's like any fundamental decision. If you make a quick, impulsive decision, is a higher probability it's going to be a bad decision versus if you really use time as your friend and take all this information and put the consideration in. <laughs> so. and, uh, listen, at Aeon, he's on, at Aeon, I was really proud of the work we did together as a team, right? The HR organization, us, we actually built a tool to assess culture in an analytic way, wow. right? And wow. it wasn't a website that we directed we directed everybody towards. And and I'll give McKinsey credit, right? One of the partners there kind of uh, opened my eyes to the fact that potentially we could measure it. And then we went through the pain and suffering of actually building a tool to do that. And what it was, it, it, it turned out better than expected because what we didn't want to do is create a new exercise that we had to, uh, had to put in place, right? We didn't want to create a new analysis where, you know, the first iteration was what we want to do is direct all of their people to this website and fill out, you know, the following questionnaire. It's like, well, is that really practical? You know, it is, there is an NDA in place. <laughs> you know, most of the people in the organization aren't aware that you're going through a transaction and asking them to fill out this cultural questionnaire isn't really practical. So what can we do? And what we figured out was, listen, through the diligence process, you're likely engaging with a lot of different one-on-ones and different interactions with different people through the organization, right? And there are other artifacts that you're requesting that speak to uh, culture, employee handbook, how they make decisions, what their benefit plans look like, what, you know, how they promote um, hiring practices, um, how they make um, uh, strategic decisions, right? Um, the engagement when you're talking to the IT lead, um, the, their CTO, um, our CIO, how, you know, what, what um, decision-making authority do they have? How do they, um, how do they plan? Uh, how do they make decisions, right? So you can gather a lot of data. All, you actually are gathering a whole bunch of data that is applicable to culture already. So what you need to do, though, is just uh, uh, gather that data, evaluate it with an eye towards what does this say about culture, Right. And so what we did is we did that, we went through, we developed a tool, we execute that tool um, uh, on, the comp- uh, on the target that we're acquiring, but then we also executed it on ourselves. Because while, while we were at Aon at least, um, speak, we were um, uh, a very culture driven and we had a strong central culture um, around the organization. Implementation, you know, there were regional variances, right? Aon Brazil isn't exactly like Aon the US, which is Aon France or, or the, the UK. So you wanted to make sure that you understood the culture of the company that you're integrating into. The end objective, <coughs> excuse me, wasn't to say what is a good deal and where what deals should we walk away from. It was really more towards an uh, with an eye towards. Hey, these are the areas of where friction is going to arise, um, uh, likely to, likely to arise. Be sensitive to it and build the build the integration plan with that knowledge, right? So that you accommodate the cultural differences between the two organizations, right? In some instances, yeah, I, I raised my hand. I said, I really, really think this is a bad idea. Um, small deals, um, integrating into a specific uh, specific country, and if the the seller's culture was that different from our own, you know, sometimes you do raise your hand and and say, I really don't think, you know, economics aside, I I think this is a really horrible idea. This will not integrate well. This will be disruptive. This will cause more problems than, than you're, than than we envision. And, um, and more often than not, right. That, 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 that's, that's exactly what happens. Um, and it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm really good. Not at all. It's just, Culture is that important, right? You need to, if you, if you see cultural conflict, good economics aren't going to overcome, um, overcome that. Um, but, but also being aware of kind of how they make decisions, how your target um, uh, um, uh, allocates authority, 
Um, and th that that needs to be incorporated into your integration plan. So, yeah, there's a lot you can understand and mitigate with cultural difference, but then there's eventually yeah. a threshold where it's like you're probably better off walking away. Uh, and I guess tying back to the the prior point that the more kind of time you have on your timeline or deal to put consideration towards this part is probably going to lend to higher likeliness of success, success versus being on a very compressed process. That is correct, right? Your time is a seller's friend; it is not a buyer's friend. You 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 like time, right? The the more time you can spend with them, the better you understand the risks you're about to step into, and uh, can can plan uh, plan accordingly or price accordingly. What's the craziest thing you've seen in M and A? Oh, I've seen seen some seen some wacky things, right? Um, uh, I saw not in the U.S. Um, uh fraud being advertised in a sim as uh, as a performa adjustment um so you know in, in our in a previous world you know fiduciary cash is uh, is client money and you need to be treated accordingly in almost every country you're not allowed to use that for operations and um i saw a sim that uh, the sellers were requesting for a performa adjustment for client monies that they were retaining without telling the client um, they, uh, they, their argument was it's, 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 um, it's, it's practice, um, normal practice in their industry, uh, and talked with our team and they said, no, no, that that's called fraud. And, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, needless to say, did not go through with that transaction and then actually had to go through pretty, pretty detailed analysis, um, with our legal team to understand what our, what our obligations were after that we uncovered that. So. Wow. Yeah, kind of crazy. That's pretty crazy. That's yeah. definitely on the crazier side. <laughs> hey, I uh, enjoy this conversation. It sounds like there's more conversations to have. I like the idea of picking a topic and having corp dev legal perspective. I think that'd be fun. I think I think it'd be a blast, right? So, listen, you've got you've got uh, uh, some great corporate development professionals um, in your network, um, and having them on with counsel that they've done multiple deals with, um, especially in-house counsels that they may not be both at the same firm ideally any longer, <laughs> where they can talk freely about their previous transactions. Ooh. I think that'd be an absolute blast. Okay, I'm. I forgot. I think February 23rd is going to be the next summit. We have one next week. Yeah. By the time this thing gets published, it'll be long gone. Tashin, so probably edit that out. Uh, but <laughs> we have our next summit by February 23rd or somewhere day before or after. Uh, we'll do a session. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm counting on you to find the counterpart on the legal got, side. And then we'll I come got two guys. Up. I got two guys for you. All righty. We'll let them debate and pick one. And we'll start there. I, I, I like the idea. Let's do it. And thank you so much for having me, uh, for spending the time with me today, Ken. Thank you so much for having me on, man. This has been a blast. Hey, thanks. And here's to the deal. All right. Take care.